sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Justice. I will start with uh, listed questions. I have to remind members that question number one, two and nine have been withdrawn. I therefore call Mr Raymond McCartney. Question number three, please, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. The senior management team at McGilligan has an action plan in place that records all 79 recommendations made by criminal justice inspection. The recommendations are broken down into those that have been accepted, partially accepted, accepted in principle, or not accepted. All accepted recommendations have already been allocated to a senior manager who has the lead responsibility in ensuring that these recommendations are implemented. A number of recommendations cannot be Im implemented at this time, for example, replacing the house blocks. This recommendation and others will be addressed when the new prison is eventually built. There will be regular review meetings held by McGilligan senior management on a quarterly basis to closely monitor and record any progress made against the Sajini recommendations. Following these review meetings, both the Director General and I will be provided with progress reports. Well, Mr. McCartney for supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. I mean, over, over a number of reports, uh, the McGilligan Prison has featured very well in terms of Sajini reports. I'm just wondering, as, as part of the senior management team's approach, will they be looking at the slippage areas and what perhaps led to the slippage in some of the areas where it is now weaker? Well, I appreciate Mr McCartney's supplementary, Principal Deputy Speaker. Yes, the key concern is the slippage specifically around the area of constructive activity, which was the disappointing result. I think there is a, an element where it's clear that the increasing prisoner numbers have meant that a lower proportion were actually having constructive activity, but con getting constructive and purposeful activity back for all prisoners is a key part of the work. And I entirely accept uh, Mr McCartney's point. We need to ensure that that slippage back is redressed in the next few months. Well, Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, could I... Uh, welcome the Minister's response to the question that has been put. Um, certainly, a purposeful activity is, uh, seems to me to be the central requirement uh, of the report uh, by Sajini. But it also should be emphasised that Sajini's report was positive in relation to the overall running of the prison and the retention of the current ethos of the prison, which is very positive, should be at the centre. Would the Minister agree? Well, yes, I'm happy to endorse the, the positive words about that report from Mr McGuinness. Um, as we tend to forget when we emphasise the work that has to be done, on three of the four key tests, McGilligan performed well. It was just the, un, uh, the unfortunate uh, issue of slipping back on the constructive and purposeful activity which needs to be addressed. But in other respects, McGilligan has scored extremely well by comparison with the past and is scoring well by comparison with other prisons across the UK. I call Mr Chris Hazard. Plans for the future of the court estate, including those for Downpatrick Courthouse, will not be finalised until I've had an opportunity to consider the outcome of the ongoing consultation exercise. Downpatrick Courthouse is not one of the venues currently under consideration for closure. The consultation paper indicates that in the event of the closure of Newtonard Courthouse, family business relating to the Petty Sessions District of Down will transfer from Newtonard to Downpatrick. Cool. <laughs> I thank the Minister for his answer. I think that will bring uh, quite a lot of uh, relief to some people in, in, in and around the Downpatrick area who feared that the future of the Downpatrick Courthouse uh, was going to be yet another service we were going to lose over our county town to centralisation. So that comes as quite a relief. Uh, I, I know the, the Department of Justice are now looking at uh, perhaps the opportunity to decentralise some of its headquarters. Would the Minister perhaps look at Downpatrick as a venue where this might take place? Gormogut. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I was going to welcome Mr Hazard's uh, positive comments about the courthouse uh, consultation. I think he's the first MLA who's actually stood up in this chamber and welcomed an aspect of that, which is something of a rarity, and therefore um, I should be grateful. However, when he then pushes me around the decentralisation of services, um, there's certainly a project ongoing 
looking at the accommodation provision for the Department of Justice and its agencies as a whole, um, whether that will involve any question of decentralization uh, out of the greater Belfast area is an issue which is very much under, you know, uh, under consideration at this time, but I'm not sure that given the range of responsibilities that the Department has, that it is likely to be a decentralization away from greater Belfast as opposed to bringing agencies together within Belfast. Mr. Alistair Ross. Um, the Minister will be aware that there is a, a campaign from a number of different council areas about keeping their local courthouses open. Does he see any, re any reason why local councils can't work with uh, the department and with the, the court service to utilise those facilities better so that, that, that courthouses can become a community facility in the evening time and used by local community groups or used by the council themselves as a way of keeping those facilities in local areas? Well, I agree entirely with Mr. Ross's general point, and indeed, um, in two of the meetings that I have had uh, with council representatives concerned about the issue of courthouse closures, the issue has been raised about potential additional use for courthouses. Now, courthouses are perhaps not as flexible as some people might wish. They do tend to have a lot of built-in furniture and so on. But uh, I am open to looking at what might be possible in order to spread the costs of maintaining those buildings. That was the remit which I left with officials from the Courts and Tribunal Service in at least those two cases where people came with specific proposals. And I'm quite happy to look to see what may be possible, though I, I suspect uh, courthouses are not as flexible in some senses as we would hope them to be. But it is unfortunate at the moment they're probably some of the public buildings which are used fewest hours in the week. Oh, Mr. Robin Swan. Deputy Speaker, just following on from that, Minister. Minister, can you confirm have you had any approaches from the Mid and East Antrim Council on the possibility of other additional uses to the Ballymena Courthouse? I'm happy to confirm to Mr. Swan uh, that indeed one of the delegations I've met included the Member of Parliament for North Antrim, um, members of the Mid and East Antrim Council, some business interests around Ballymena, and indeed I believe one of the councillors who was present said that he was representing Mr Swan at the meeting. Uh, so I'm happy to confirm that that was, you know, that was a positive engagement around Ballymena. Call Mr Stewart, Dixon. Thank you, uh, President Deputy Speaker. Minister, in the inevitable change to the um, estate of court services, other jurisdictions have, by way of doing this um, reorganisation of courts, also modernised the facilities, brought in electronic facilities, and provided a great deal more online services for uh, members of the, of the uh, legal professions. What action plan do you have in place to do that for the courthouses as this project moves forward? Well, I thank Mr. Dixon for that question. Indeed, it is the case that we need to look to make the best of the more modern parts of the, uh, of the court estate. Um, there's been an investment of something in the region of £10 million recently uh, in terms of the improvement of the way the courts and tribunal services operate, particularly around things like an IT system, the ability to have uh, live links into all the major courthouses. But it's also the case that it's only the more modern courthouses that have facilities like the proper segregation of vulnerable witnesses, especially children, uh, or indeed victims in the case of some serious criminal offences from perpetrators. That's why the issue is ensuring that we, in, we uh, give people a better service when they reach a courthouse, even if they may have to travel slightly further from a district currently served by one of the older buildings. Call Ms. Michelle McElveen. Question five, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, prior to consulting on the closure of the courthouses, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service reviewed all areas of expenditure to minimise the impact of budget reductions on frontline delivery. As a result, cuts totalling £2.6 million were delivered in 2014-15, and further cuts totalling £1.8 million have been identified for implementation in 2015-16. These cuts, which total £4.4 .4 million, or 10.8%, have been delivered from existing contracts reducing leased accommodation, the temporary closure of the old town hall building in Belfast, an 11% reduction in the Courts and Tribunal Service staffing complement, and reducing judicial expenditure. In line with DFP's Managing Public Money document, the Courts and Tribunal Service is also considering, in the context of ensuring full cost recovery, the potential to increase court fees. I have already indicated, including a few minutes ago, that I am willing to consider any other options suggested by members or by local councils. Ms McElveen for a supplementary. Well, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his answer, and I hope that he can provide um, Newton Ours with the same relief that he has provided Downpatrick. Um, 
But has the minister consulted other executive ministers about the transfer of tribunal hearings relevant to their departments out of expensive city centre accommodation and into existing publicly owned under threat court buildings? Well, Ms. Mahmoud makes a very reasonable point about the use of courthouses for tribunals. It's also the case that in some areas, most notably recently in Uri, um, other MLAs have complained about the use of courthouses which they see as associated with the criminal justice system with tribunals. We have sought to uh, make the best use of the court's estate and not be hiring additional expensive facilities. But there is an issue in some areas where that is not always accepted by those who use the tribunals. Hello, Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, I wonder is the Minister sufficiently chastened by the dressing down he got from the Lord Chief Justice and his decision to close up to half of the courthouses? And is he sufficiently humbled now to go back and review some of the daftest decisions? Uh, well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't recognise the dressing down I was given. Um, it's also just to remind Mr. Dallet, who I thought would have appreciated after the length of time he and I have both been in this chamber, would have appreciated the concept of the word consultation, which is not a decision, it's a consultation. But it's a consultation on the back of a very difficult financial situation for the Department of Justice and the savings that have to be made across the courts and tribunal service. If Mr. Dallet has specific suggestions to make as to how matters can be uh, dealt with and how those costs can be addressed, then I'm very happy to, uh, to hear them and to discuss them with him. But uh, the kind of uh, references he makes to dressing down and silly ideas isn't actually constructive in dealing with the massive financial problems we have ahead of us. Call Mr. Jim Mallister. Yes. Um, given the obviously strong negative response that's coming through in the consultation from court users, from practitioners and from the judges who sit in those courts. Is the minister yet ready to face up to and acknowledge that his were ill thought out proposals which do despite to the convenience of court users and which would put extra burdens beyond capacity into other courts. Is he big enough to acknowledge he got it wrong and to retreat from his preposterous position? Well, it's good to see Mr. Dalek can be exceeded in hyperbole anyway, but that, I suppose, is always to be expected. The reality is, Principal Deputy Speaker, that of course there is a negative response. People may just have heard occasionally if proposals come forward to close schools or health facilities, that it gets a negative response from people in the immediate area. But that doesn't mean that changes don't have to be made to deal with the budget. I repeat the point to Mr. Alistair that I made to Mr. Dallet, although I'm not sure that there'll be anything of a positive response to it. If there are specific suggestions to be made in order to deal with the difficult budget pressures on the courts and tribunal service, I'm very happy to hear them. But to just go off with lines like, preposterous and ill thought out. When the Courts and Tribunal Service did a very detailed examination of the need for court sittings, examination of the accessibility from one town to another, an examination of the whole way in which the business could be structured better using IT and uh, links and so on, all of that has been done in a practical and sensible and serious way and should not be derided by the kind of language that Mr. Alistair uses. Call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Currently, special educational needs cases are funded under the Legal Advice and Assistance Scheme, commonly known as the Green Form. Advice can be given to assist the applicant to prepare for the SEN Tribunal or to prepare to challenge a decision of the Education Board if it's believed to have failed to provide special assistance or reasonable adjustments for a child. Green Form is not available for advocacy or representation at the Tribunal. I have no plans to introduce changes to legal aid in relation to special education tribunals. Therefore, provision will remain at the current level. Call Ms Boyle for a supplementary. Yeah, uh, can I uh, thank the Minister for a response and uh, welcome the fact that there is to be no change. But will the Minister give assurance in the interest of all children, and particularly children from deprived 
background remains paramount in any changes made in any or every aspect of legal, uh, legal aid. Gormogat. Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm quite happy to give Ms O'Boyle that reassurance that all the changes that are being made are being done in a way which will seek to protect those who are most vulnerable. So, for example, whilst the proposals exist around reforming uh, green form advice, there is no proposal to change it with regard to mental health review tribunals, asylum and immigration, special educational needs or children's order cases, the kind of vulnerable uh, groups which I think Ms O'Boyle is highlighting. But there are changes which will have to be made in order to live within the budget. The important thing is that the Department is seeking to protect the vulnerable people in every circumstance. Call Mr Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, if the Minister could just um, doubly reassure on a belt and braces uh, process uh, regarding special education tribunals, are there no changes at all in terms of any provision that might be made through legal aid that is administered by his department to people who will use that process in the incoming year? Principal Deputy Speaker, all I can do is repeat to Mr Campbell the last line of what I said earlier. I have no plans to introduce changes to legal aid in relation to special educational tribunals. Provision will remain at the current level. Call Mr Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd just like to ask the Minister what impact proposed legal aid cuts will have on family court proceedings, if any. Well, again, to Mr. Cree, Principal Deputy Speaker, in, uh, in seeking to protect uh, those who belong to vulnerable groups, there are key issues around the family courts. I have already made clear that I believe that there are cases when, for example, there are repeat applications by a legally aided ex-partner uh, in the case of things like access to children, and those have to be addressed. But the fundamental issues of work in the family courts, legal aid will remain available as on the current basis. Mr. Martin O'Milmer. I get a few last John Corlea cast a shock. Question number seven. In Hyde Bank College, the artist in resident projects were contracted through the Prison Arts Foundation. The Prison Arts Foundation has completed a number of projects within Hyde Bank aimed at changing the prison environment through visual art. The projects have included painting of a number of wallscapes throughout the college to channel offenders' energies to positive ends, improving self worth and helping offenders build new skills. Various artworks have been exhibited at the Waterfront Hall, Castlereagh Library, and here at Stormont. Artists in residence have also inspired a number of offenders to take part in the arts by entering artwork to be judged through the Kistler Arts Award Scheme. This has proved successful with a high number of awards being achieved. Due to the reduction of funding across all government departments, the Northern Ireland Prison Service has had to reduce the provision of PAF services across all prisons, including Hyde Bank. For supplementary. I want to thank the Minister for, for his response. Uh, it's, it's depressing news uh, that the Prison Arts Foundation has been cut from £240,000 to £83,000, that the number of artists and residents is cut from four to two. But I would ask the Minister, uh, would you look again at this vital area of work because I often think that expenditure on tighter security doesn't bring the same benefits as expenditure on the Prison Arts Foundation. And I, I know the, the Minister is very familiar with the work of the PAF, uh, but is this something he could review to see can we increase the number of uh, residencies again? Well, I take Mr Moyler's point, although I suspect if we reduced expenditure on security of prisons, there'd be other members of this House would be complaining if anything went wrong, so we do need to be realistic. I appreciate that there were concerns on the part of PAF, as indeed some of our other voluntary sector partners, about the reduction in costs. That's why I was pleased that we were able to find the £83,000 which Mr Moyler uh, refers to uh, in order to maintain a level of service. But that is the blunt reality of the world in which we currently live. Difficult decisions have been taken in which many positive areas of justice spending have had to be reduced because of the budget that the executive has given to the Department of Justice. What I do believe, however, is that we are getting the best possible value from those services which are currently being provided. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, I got to you, uh, you Thanks very much, Mr. President, uh, Speaker. Um, uh, could I ask the Minister, <clears throat> given the constraints that he has to work within 
uh, from the DUP Sinn Féin budget that has been handed down to him. Uh, could he give some indication as to what progress has been made at Hyde Bank in regard to providing further or proper education and training skills for young offenders? Well, I thank uh, Mr. McLone for that, that question, Principal Deputy Speaker, because there's been a significant amount of work done. Members will have seen the news uh, publication, the fact that Hyde Bank Wood is now formally designated as a college, that there is very significant engagement in constructive activity, whether uh, what might be seen as more traditional education around matters like essential skills or vocational training. And I believe it's something in the region of over 70% of those uh, within Hyde Bank Wood on the male side, because it doesn't currently apply to Ash House, um, are engaging in some of those constructive activities with Belfast Met providing these services, which will make an easier transition for those who are engaged in courses as they leave the college to continue in courses in outside venues. I believe that's an absolutely fundamental step forward in the way in which we manage the services for young male offenders. I believe it's a very significant and almost groundbreaking in the context of UK prisons as a whole, and we should actually be proud of the work which is being done by the prison service. Mr. Stephen Ignew is not in his place. I call Ms. Rosie McCorley. Principal Deputy Speaker, the Indictable Cases pilot was launched on the 2nd of January in the Court Division of Arts. It will run for a period of 12 months with an initial evaluation in June. Through the scheme, the criminal justice agencies are implementing a number of changes to how cases are investigated and cases prepared, including the greater use of pre-interview disclosure by the police, the provision of a case outline to facilitate early engagement with the defence, and a new statement at police interview stage, highlighting to suspects the potential benefits of entering a plea at the earliest opportunity. The pilot also makes use of improved investigative pathways clearer file standards with effective supervision, earlier prosecutorial advice to the police in relation to charging, the timely and proportionate use of forensic and other evidence, and for contested cases, earlier discussions between parties with a view to narrowing the issues. Average times for pilot cases against the average times for cases elsewhere in Northern Ireland indicate significant improvements in performance, and this reflects the considerable effort that is being made by the police and the PPS. However, the evaluation will be essential in determining feasibility of rollout. I'm encouraged by the positive progress to date and the potential this offers to improve processing times. Ms. McCorley for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, and can I ask the Minister, um, would, would he be, um, will the impact of the pilot scheme impel him to try this in, in other areas? Well, uh, we would be slightly premature to give a definite answer to that, but certainly the early indications, and you appreciate we haven't even reached the halfway evaluation, are that there are definite improvements in the way that cases are progressed to the benefit of defendants as well as of victims and witnesses, and that has to be applauded. On the other hand, it has required a significant input of resources by some of the agencies involved, and we need to be sure for, before we attempt to roll it out that we are able to put those additional resources into the cases which might... Uh, be considered for inclusion elsewhere. So uh, I will be looking closely at the halfway stage in June and again at the December evaluation to see what is possible because it is clear that one issue we need to address significantly in this society is speeding up justice to ensure that cases are in court quicker, that victims and witnesses are not kept waiting and that those who are to be sentenced are made aware of the benefits of early guilty pleas if they're going to plead guilty and that they, you know, that also assists in speeding things up. Mr. Paul Frew. 11. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. In the context of the financial challenges facing my department, the consultation paper sets out proposals for a reduced court estate. These proposals seek to maximise the use of our larger, more modern, and better equipped court buildings, while seeking as far as possible to mitigate the impact for court users. There is no requirement for a court to be located in each council area, and it would be wrong to make it such a requirement. My objective in seeking to rationalise the court estate is to ensure we deliver a service that is efficient, effective and affordable. I believe that the proposal to transfer business from Ballymena to Antrim and Coleraine, when taken with the additional flexibility that a single jurisdiction will deliver, will achieve that objective. 
Mr. Frew for a supplementary. I thank the uh, Minister for his answer. And can the Minister assure this House that no matter what comes out of the consultation on the court closures, that uh, it, errors will not be completed in the closure of courthouses? Because even in my own area of North Antrim, and in particular Bellamina, when we lost the hospital, there's not a trust official nowadays that won't say that that wasn't a mistake. I believe closing the Bellamina Courthouse would be a massive mistake. How can the Minister assure that this House that errors will not happen with any closure of any courthouse? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, it would be a foolish Minister who said that errors could never happen. But I'm not sure why Mr Frew is suggesting that errors would be more likely to happen were there to be uh, the closure of Ballymena or any other specific courthouse. The reality is we have to work with the budget which is available, and I believe it's more important to put budget into ensuring that we have adequate staffing, adequate judicial cover, proper facilities for individuals when they reach court, than keeping, you know, keeping the budget used to maintain buildings, some of which are less than ideal when those who have to use the courthouses arrive there. Mr. Roybeck. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. One issue the Minister didn't mention, and that is the importance of justice being seen to be done. Would the Minister recognise that in uh, not having a, a court within one of the new council areas, that there is a huge danger that uh, court decisions and sentences will not be reported in local papers and confidence in the law could be reduced? Well, I certainly agree with Mr. Beggs that we do need justice to be seen to be done, but I would remind him that in his own constituency, Newton Abbey and Carrickfergus haven't had courts for many years, and I'm not aware that that issue has been raised with me when those cases are, are heard in Lagonside. Um, Larne, similarly, has not had a court for a couple of years, and no complaints have, been reached, uh, have reached me about justice not being seen to be done there. So I think it's a, a suggestion that in, in modern communication days, it's not impossible for the reporter from a local paper to drive 10 miles and ensure that the local papers continue to carry the stories of local court decisions. Call Mr. Jim Allister. He talks about living within his budget. Would he then like to explain to the House why he spent £1.7 million upgrading the Balamina Courthouse that he now wants to close? Well, the answer is very simple. As I've said on a number of occasions with regard to a number of buildings, Principal Deputy Speaker, in certain cases, essential work had to be done to maintain health and safety issues around the building, to ensure that buildings were compliant with the Disability Discrimination Act. And that was in a period before the Department of Justice was hit with the very significant budget uh, cuts which were imposed in year during the last financial year. Mr. Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question 12. In establishing 2015-16 budgets, I've sought to protect frontline public services as far as possible against cuts to my department's budget. Throughout the 2015-16 the budget process, I've highlighted that very difficult funding decisions will be required. It is important to note that the starting point for the department's budget is a 15.1% cut against our 2014-15 opening baseline, that's £165 million. The Executive then provided an allocation of £90 million, equivalent to 6.4 per cent. £20 million of that was provided as part of the final budget process, ring-fenced to the PSNI, who in total will receive £65 million of the 90. The balance of the Executive funding that has not gone to the police has been allocated based on our priorities. In some areas, it will be used to offset the impact of baseline cuts and so some areas have cuts lower than 15.1%. In other areas, it's been used to offset specific demand-led pressures as far as possible. For example, the core department is making savings of 22% so that savings can be reallocated to the front line. And separately, the Treasury is providing £29.5 million of security funding, not baseline related, specific funding to the police for a specific purpose. To inform the decisions on final budget allocations, the Department considered the outcome of the budget consultation exercise and savings delivery plans. Final budget reductions for the Department's arm's length bodies included the following. To the Police Ombudsman, a cut of 5 per cent. PRRT, 5 per cent. The Police, 5.7 per cent. Probation Board, 9.2 per cent. 
the IUC George Cross Foundation 11.8%, Sigini 12%, Northern Ireland Police Fund 12%, and the Policing Board 15.1%. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Ms. Rosie McCorley. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, regardless of whether the Health Minister brings forward medical guidelines on fetal, fetal ab abnormality, can he confirm to us that he uh, will bring forward legislation on this very sensitive issue? Well, I appreciate Ms. McCauley's question. I cannot guarantee that I will bring forward legislation because for a minister to bring forward legislation requires executive approval. Um, I did believe that the consultation on abortion would have been better conducted jointly between the Health and Justice Departments, but the previous Health Minister did not wish that that to be the case. So I proceeded with the consultation on the criminal justice aspects of abortion, on the basis of which uh, I am proposing to recommend to the executive the recommendation that was put in the consultation to allow abortion in the case, the very narrow case, of fatal fetal abnormality where there's no prospect of a viable life for the fetus after delivery and no treatment beyond palliative care could be offered. That is the proposal I will put to the executive and I hope the executive will support me in enabling legislation to be put to this house. Ms. McCauley for supplementary. Can I ask the Minister, does he have a timeline when this might happen? Uh, I can't give a timeline at this stage, Principal Deputy Speaker, but the answer is I will put a paper to the Executive as soon as it can be drawn up. It will then be a matter for the Executive, well, for the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, to decide whether it will be tabled for the executive and for the executive to decide if it wishes to go ahead. I appreciate that this is an issue which is extremely difficult for many people in this society, but I do believe it is right that we should legislate in this one narrow area. Mr. John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. On taking up uh, ministerial office in 2010, and I quote the minister said, today is the not the completion of the process. The completion of the process will come uh, when the devolved assembly and executive carry out their duties well, consistently, and in partnership for all of the people in Northern Ireland. Does the minister now recognise that the way we elect an MLA to uh, hold his office actually holds back the normalisation of politics here? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, it's not often that people quote me. I thought Mr McAllister was quoting me approvingly. Um, I don't actually agree with him that the way in which the Justice Minister is elected is holding back politics. I must say, I believe that the way in which the Justice Minister is elected by a weighted majority in this Assembly is the appropriate way in which an executive as a whole should be formed, and I believe that that would actually be closer to normalisation of politics than the method by which FM and DFM are appointed by their parties, and then other ministers are appointed uh, by parties in, you know, in series. So I would have thought that the, the way in which the Justice Minister is appointed is actually the way forward for this Assembly to move towards normalisation, while still maintaining the need for a, a majority support which is significantly higher than 50% plus one. McAllister for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for his, uh, his analysis on that, that he's sort of trailblazing in, in front of him. Would he accept that in 2007 and uh, the 2007 11 programme for government, he voted against but took up office? He then uh, he's now a minister in an executive that doesn't really have a programme for government. Does he not think it's vital when you form a government that you'd have a negotiated and agreed? programme for government, collective cabinet responsibility, would also go a long way to take the fear out of who holds the Justice Ministry. And will he give an undertaking now that neither he nor any member of the Alliance Party will take the Justice Ministry in 2016 if they do not agree with the programme for government? I think there are about six questions in that one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Just to highlight the point, yes, I believe I did vote against the programme for government in 2007 because I believed it was inadequate in certain aspects around building a united community and overcoming our divisions. But at the, but at the point when I took office, it was on the basis of the agreement of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to what Alliance put forward as the proposals for what would be the addendum to the PFG for the Department of Justice. 
And that is the programme which has been largely implemented over the last five years, having just celebrated our fifth birthday last week. Uh, it's clear that on one or two occasions, uh, issues have arisen which were not covered by that PFG addendum, uh, which have sometimes created differences within this chamber. But by and large, considering the difficulties of a department like Justice, there's been a large measure of agreement. And I believe that is because we got that agreement sorted out before I accepted office. Um, so I do, you know, whilst I take entirely his point, um, and I do believe that uh, the world would be better if the programme for government uh, was agreed by parties which were then willing to form an executive rather than mathematics putting people into the executive to see if they can form a programme for government. I would as a minister have to say we do actually have a programme for government, whether it's being honoured in, in full substance I will leave it to others to decide. Um, but when he asked me to give a guarantee that there will be no Alliance Minister taking uh, the Department of Justice in 2016, I am minded to quote the Member of Parliament or the outgoing Member of Parliament for Fermanagh South Tyrone and never say never. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the uh, tragic death of uh, young Adam Owens in Utenards last week. Um, Adam's family and indeed the whole community um, blame the legal highs for this tragic happening. I'm sure the Minister, along with all the members of this House will join with me in offering our total and absolute sympathy to the Owens family at this terrible time. Will the Minister outline to the House what steps he will take to ensure that these, legal, uh, these lethal substances are made illegal and placed well out of reach of all of the population in Northern Ireland? Well, certainly I'm very happy to join Kieran McCarthy in expressing my sympathy to the family of Adam Owens as well. Um, it's just a couple of weeks ago that I had a, a meeting with Beach Mount Mums Against Drugs, which was formed following the death of uh, Sean Paul Carnahan, also from so-called legal, legal highs, or to be more accurate, new psychoactive substances. Um, the Misuse of Drugs Act, as I've said in this chamber before, is not uh, a devolved issue. It's a reserved matter for Westminster and therefore we have limited powers. However, I have talked in the past about work which has been led in particular by Belfast City Council and also I think by Oma District Council was second and Larn may have fallen in as well, um, using consumer uh, safety legislation to deal with the issue of legal highs. I have also been lobbying the Home Office, seeking to get them to take the matter seriously. I've had correspondence with the outgoing uh, Minister with responsibility for drug, uh, drug policy within the Home Office, and I would hope to be meeting uh, the, uh, the appropriate Minister after the election is, is resolved at Westminster, because I believe it's essential that we use the knowledge we have here of how matters have been addressed in Northern Ireland, and indeed how matters have been addressed across the border, to ensure that we get the best possible action across the UK as a whole, but that rests with the Home Office and not with us. MacArthur for supplement. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Deputy Speaker. I do welcome the Minister's um, commitment to see uh, some improvement uh, on this uh, terrible tragedy, um, not only this one, but other tragedies. And I do welcome the Minister's uh, commitment to tackle the, uh, whoever the new incoming Minister is at the Home Office. But will the, will the Minister ensure that whatever um, is developed between himself and the Home Office, that um, it's a de deadly serious issue and we want to see these legal highs um, made illegal and well out of the reach of everyone, particularly our young population here in Northern Ireland and across the UK. Well, yes, again, I agree entirely. We need to ensure that the matter is dealt with. It is, of course, a slight irony that some of these issues are referred to as legal highs or some of these substances where they may well uh, contain individual substances which are illegal but we need to find legislation which actually deals with the reality on the ground, the tragedies that have suffered, have, people have suffered in Northern Ireland, including quite a number of people who died last year as a result of NPSs, and that we don't allow the niceties of legislation or the, uh, the changing of an occasional molecule in, you know, in the chemical composition to obstruct the efforts of law enforcement agencies to protect people, especially the young people who are most likely to engage in the consumption of these substances. Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware this Thursday at half past one I'll be launching the first in a series of justice seminars aimed at promoting innovation within the, the justice uh, system here in Northern Ireland. Can the Minister indicate what is the most innovative policy he has come up with in the last five years in office? 
Oh, Principal Deputy Speaker, there are so many positive things. I couldn't possibly <laughs> just highlight one of them. I, I think if we were to actually look at the one which will have the most far-reaching effect, it is probably the reform of the prison system. Because let's remember, I mean, I was told directly by a former Northern Ireland office minister that prison reform was left in the too difficult tray, under direct rule and left for devolution to happen. And the good work which was done by the prison reform team, by uh, Dame Anne Owers and her colleagues, <laughs> undoubtedly produced an excellent report, which allowed for the fact that there were some political disagreements in this place as to, as to exactly how some aspects of it will be implemented, has nonetheless formed the basis of a very significant reform from the culture in which the prison service was effectively given the job of guarding the perimeter of prisons to one in which we now see very positive work going on, the sort of work which I saw uh, highlighted in the Ornella unit in Ash House recently of the additional work assisting women to get their lives back on track, the work which has turned the Young Offender Centre into a college, the work which has got the good result we highlighted earlier for McGilligan, and the ongoing work in the very difficult and complex prison of McGabry to ensure that life is much better there. By the time we have the final report of the three-year oversight group in the autumn of this year, I believe we will see all significant recommendations have been signed off to the point where all that remains is capital funding. And I think that is something which we sometimes forget. It's frankly a reform program as big as the reform program that brought the PS9 into operation, but it's gone through on a much quieter way. Mr. Ross, for supplementary. Thank you, yeah, again. Innovation within uh, justice and innovative policies have the opportunity to have better outcomes uh, for a, a more cost-effective to the, the public purse. One of the areas where there are significant difficulties within the court system and clogging up of the courts, can I ask the Minister if he has any discussions with the judiciary or the court service about how we can digitise the court service and perhaps look at online courts for disputes of low-level uh, uh, disputes? The concept of online courts is an interesting one, Principal Deputy Speaker, which uh, hasn't come across my desk in any formal way. It certainly is in line with what we're seeking to do to reform the way the court system operates to make it more effective and more efficient. Uh, but I think uh, people for some time are likely to expect their presence in the court if they're to, in the proverbial, have their day. Although we should acknowledge it's not that long ago that the prisoner escort service was spending an enormous amount of time and effort transporting prisoners from jails to courthouses just for simple remand hearings for a minute or two. We've got away with that by video links. There may be other ways in which we can develop it, uh, but I shall look forward to those who have greater experience of the IT niceties than I do to make the specific suggestions. Oh, Mr. David McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I wonder would the Minister I'd like to comment on the Law Society's comments uh, that his approach to the closure of local courthouses has the very definite potential to be penny-wise yet pound-foolish? Well, I hear lots of things said by the Law Society, including some of the predictions they've made about the terrible things that would happen when we reformed criminal legal aid a couple of years ago and the so-called strike, which some of them engaged in for a while, before they recognised the reality of what has to be done to live within a budget and reform the system. So I'm afraid I don't recognise any sense in that particular uh, point which is made by the Law Society. I don't see any suggestion. But the reality is, if the Law Society believes that the proposals around courthouse reform are penny-wise and pound-foolish, then I hope they will engage with the Department of Justice in finding a better way of dealing with matters given the budget constraints we live under. Mr McElveen for a supplement. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for his answer. The Law Society are critical of the Minister on this position, on this issue. The Policing Board are critical of the Minister's position in relation to how he has handled injury on duty. And the Law, Society, the law Fraternity generally has been critical of the Minister around how he has handled the redistribution of legal aid. I wonder, could the Minister identify anybody within the legal family at the moment that is not critical of him? Well, I'm sorry that Mr. McElveen highlights the things the policing board are critical of me over handling of industry on duty, in, injury on duty uh, issues when actually it is principally a responsibility for the policing board. And if we have a situation where certain solicitors and certain barristers are not terribly happy with essential reforms to legal aid, well, 
I'm sorry, but we might just possibly think they have a vested interest in the matter, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, at the moment, I would think I get on tolerably well uh, with most people in probation, most people in youth justice, uh, most people in the police service, um, and most of the civil servants working in the core of the department, supporting the work which has to be done despite the difficult budget cuts. So, at the moment, I'm reasonably content that we're still winning. Thanks. Time, time is up. Uh, 